Vale. Uh, welcome everybody, sorry for the delay. Um, welcome to the Fearless Cities, uh, Fearless Cities Summit. My name is Amaranta and I'm going to be your facilitate, the facilitator of this workshop, which has been organized by Cesar, Sergi and me. Um, in this workshop we will present several ecofeminist policies, mobility policies, and we'll discuss the role in combating air pollution. We have intentionally put the name of ecofeminist uh, because we want to highlight the importance of both feminism and also ecology when thinking about new democracies. And in the context, I mean, we, we, we truly believe we live in, in, in troubled times. And, and in the troubled times we live in, um, if we really want to build a fairer and livable world, um, this has to be grounded on both feminist but also ecological foundations. So uh, let me tell you about the structure of this workshop, how it will be. The mic is connected to the camera. It's not, there's no speakers. So, but if, if you want, I can speak slowly or more. Can you hear me properly in the, at the end? Yes, okay. Um, okay, so uh, about the structure of this workshop, uh, we have less than two hours of workshop. So this will be divided as follows. In the first hour, we will have a panel. We, we have five uh, invited speakers that will talk for 10 minutes each. Uh, after that, the second hour, we will encouraged to have like a, lo a collective conversation. This conversation will be articulated through questions that the facilitating team will, po will put on the table. And we really encourage you to participate, to, 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 to engage in the, to in the topic, and also, uh, if you can, um, talk from your experience in your municipalities, in your towns, what, in your campaigns, in your Passion, I know, the things you are passionate about. Like, talk from the things you've lived, from that point of view. Um, so, okay, so that block of questions, these questions will be divided in three blocks. Each block will have 15 minutes. So we will, put, we will be dealing with three blocks of questions. At the end of each block of questions, our guest speakers will also uh, have something, have a word to say, to participate in that conversation. Um, in order to make the, this conversation smooth, and because it's very interesting to engage in a communal uh, conversation, um, I would like to teach you some um, facilitating tools to, to have this conversation. So it's like, um, if you, so if you want to talk, if you, if you want to say something, you raise your hand and I will give you the, your, your, I, I will give you the word when, when it's your turn. If you want to, if you agree with somebody, sh show it. It's very easy. You don't have to, to talk to repeat what somebody just said. And it's very encouraging for a person who talks to see that there's people who think like that, like him or her. So if you agree with something that is being said, just show it. It sometimes it's difficult because you are not used to do it, but it's very, it's very useful, basically. And then, uh, if you are talking too much, I will intervene. I have the power of the facilitator role, so I will, I will do this sign. And this is like, okay, finish your, finish your point, finish your comment. Um, so, basically, these three things. Um, also, well, you have to know that at the exit there is a, a, a little page that if you haven't received an email and if you are not in the database of the, of the Fearless City and want to be like part of this group, just please uh, write your name and email and you'll be part of a collective like mini database on mobility and pollution. Um, and the other thing is, uh, and there's two people here, Sergio and Montserrat, who are taking notes. We'll be taking notes about everything that will be said. And then this information will be also uh, sent around all the participants as a, as a thing of 
as a feedback, as a, as a thing that you take. Um, I think that's all. Is there anything else? Ah, hashtags. If you want to tweet or something, to have, here are the hashtags that we are using in this summit, just in case you want to use it. And yeah, let's begin. So the first speaker that we are going to have is Olga Margale, and she comes from the platform campaigning for equality. Um, to talk about, air, about the problem of air pollution. Yes, I will, if, if I'm speaking too low, just, just remind me. Um, so as Amaranta said, I'm Olga. I'm from this uh, platform for air quality in Barcelona. I, I wanted to start introducing the platform. So we are grouping more than 70 organizations that working around public space, public health, uh, sustainable mobility. We have in common that we are all uh, willing or aiming a better air quality and we group um, in some campaigns to, to work for that. And you're more than welcome to visit our website, follow us on Twitter and maybe exchange later on experiences from, from your towns if we are involved in similar movements. And what should I do to... Uh, no. Okay. So air pollution, I've, I've been asked to set a, like a general framework of the problem and the main uh, policies that have been applied around the world, but all of this in 10 minutes. <laughs> so if it's impossible, I will try. Air pollution is a pretty old problem, it's not a new problem. We are facing the, it since industrial revolution, more or less. So at the beginning, because of factories, smokes and, and coal mm, burning, Nowadays, in most of the cities, the, the problem is the high density of cars and motorbikes we have going through. And it's a global problem. It's in all cities, uh, all across the continent. So it makes a lot of sense to be here and share how to face the problem. There are two main types of pollutants that we are breathing when in, in polluted cities. One is uh, particulate matter, so dust that is in the air um, as a result of combustion and that we, we breathe that, it gets in our lungs and depending on the size and or the com composition of this dust, it can be more or less toxic. So as smaller it is, it's more dangerous because it can get deeper inside our bodies. But there are also gas, gases that are a result of, of combust combustion that can be very toxic, irritating, so it's also, also a problem. These two types of pollutants um, affect our health and environment. In a, in a, when we, we focus on human health, the first step is the, the respiratory system, it's obvious. Um, this pollution has been shown how it's related to asthma crisis, bronchitis, and all type of, of illnesses, making worse also illnesses that already the person has. But it's on, not only keeping here, because these pollutants through the alveolus inside the lungs can get into our blood. So it has been, it has been shown uh, in many scientific studies how air pollution is also related with uh, higher ratios of, of uh, for example, in Barcelona, it has been shown how the days with more pollution, we have more heart attacks, we have more ictus. There's a lot of scientific um, data, uh, epidemiology uh, around this. But the, the effects of, of pollution, they go further. And now it has been also proved how it's affecting also the nervous system. So our brain, the, devel the development of the brain, for example, in young ages. In Barcelona, there was also a, a study <coughs> carried out here comparing schools, comparing teenager groups in polluted and non-polluted environments. And it has been shown how the ones 
in the polluted environment had a lower um, cognitive development in some specific um, capacities like working memory and others. It, it's also related with uh, precocious Alzheimer, for example. So it's uh, really a, a very wide, um, um, wide type of illnesses that, that the pollution is, is producing. It's a really big problem uh, on, in public health. And um, the World Health Organization estimated that more than 90% of population worldwide were, um, were, under air, um, were living in places where the air quality guidelines were not met. And the World Health Organization was also estimating that 3 million premature deaths worldwide were due to this, this trouble. And here's the main responsible in our cities and also many rural areas from this trouble. is the car, is the private transport, the car and the motorbike. Why do we have cities so um, invaded by cars? It's not a casual thing, it hasn't been a casualty. It has been because cities the last decades have been designed to put the car in the center of the public space. So the biggest infrastructures that we built in the public space were mm, de designed for the cars, for the private transportation. I like to put this image because it makes us think on how would be our home if we would organize it as we organize the public space, that at the end is the home of everybody. It would be a very big room with a car in, in, in the middle, with small rooms around where we live, and to go to one place to the other, we have to cross always the room of the car. And I also like to put this image that some of you, do you see it properly? So it's a street that it's a big cliff here. So to cross, you have to cross through a bridge. Yes, you can see it. Well, some of you maybe say this is an exaggeration, but it isn't. It's, <laughs> it's what happens. So the most of the public space we have in the cities, we cannot use walking. You can only use it if you're driving a car. And it's really dangerous if you step on here, especially for a child or an old person. Um, why I put these images? Because I want to convince you, well, I guess you are already convinced, but I want, I want to um, share the thought that it's not only a, a matter of public health, it's also a matter of how we distribute the public space in the cities, but it's also a matter of climate change, because we know that uh, reducing the private transportation and enhancing the, the uh, reducing the private, yes, and enhancing the public transportation is a, is a policy that is good to face the climate change. And it's also a matter of peak oil because the future scenario is certainly a scenario with, a, with a ail, a peak oil, no? So starting to switch the, our mobili mobility, it's a way to face, to be prepared for this. Many cities already have been working on this and I will summarize like three main uh, ways that different cities face the, face the problem. I would be happy in the second part to hear experiences from other sites or from the speakers that they will speak more on concrete policies. So we have low emission zones. In Europe is by far the, the policy that has been uh, more applied. You see more than 200 cities in Europe um, have been applying a, a low emission zone. And what is this? This is uh, to give the car a sticker with a color code. So if it's more pollutant, it has red, and if it's cleaner, it has green. And then you define an area, and you don't let in the cars that are more pollutant. This is an example, for example, of, of Berlin, this map. But we also have, okay. No, no, ah, yes. Congestion charge. What is this? This is to pay when you want to drive through the city. Um, the idea is that you're causing a damage to all population, so you pay for it every time you go in and you dr you're driving. This is the example of London, Milan, but also in Singapore, in the United States, in San Diego. So it has been also applied worldwide. And this is the example of Stockholm. 
where they did a six month trial. There's somebody from Stockholm here. Okay, maybe you can explain better <laughs> later. So, but, but uh, I think you did a first uh, uh, a trial, no? For some months, and then there was a, a referendum. This is a, a good idea because uh, it showed how experience is the best way to convince people to do these changes because they are changes that are very unpopular when they are applied at the beginning. So, uh, I, uh, you maybe later you can explain us, but what I, what I heard is that at the beginning the public opinion was mainly against it, but after um, um, being with this, dealing with this, and seeing how the traffic was reduced, reduced and the air quality was, um, was better, um, at the end the referendum was won. So, and there's a third way um, that would be to implement super blocks, areas where cars cannot drive. This is a good solution also because you're not only reducing the traffic, you're also changing the use of public space. And this would be an example. If you have a street, uh, a city where you can drive um, all around these red lines and you change it to this type of city where you only can drive through um, specific uh, roads and the rest are pedestrian, you certainly will will lower your, your traffic. I'm, I'm um, just uh, mentioning this very simple. And I, I, I end now with this uh, slide because if you have to choose a glass of water, you will choose the, the right one, I guess. And to breathe is important as to drink. In our cities, we don't have the, we have no choice, we cannot choose. We are, we are breathing every day, this glass. So it's really it's a really an important subject to to face. Our next speaker is Silvia Casorran. She comes from the Public Transport Association. Um, yeah. and she's here. <laughs> My slides are not about the presentation itself. They are just slides about the super block. And they are just pictures. But I didn't organize them to be automatically passing. So I, I think I just passed through them very quickly. You will see images from before and after the superblock is implemented, just to, well, maybe we can think a little bit about it. And then I will have the speech. I, w I hope I'm, I'm quite quick with by talking. I'm a civil servant at Met uh, Barcelona Metropolitan Area, and I, I work specifically about cycling policies, but I also, I'm also a board member of Public Transport Association, as Amaranta said, and also from um, Public No Neighbors Association. And a few months ago, we just created the Neighbors Asso Association from the Superblock, and there I'm the vice president, okay? But I, I will talk about... Um, more uh, big, a bigger uh, reflection. Yeah, okay, the micro. Okay. Maybe Cesar can just pass the, the slides and then I will talk because us, I think it's just images and then it's very, the weight is quite high. Um, well, 70 years ago, there were no cars in, in our cities. We had uh, trams, we had bicycles, we had horses, and we had pedestrians, okay, but no cars. Um, we had public transport and we had non-motorized uh, transport modes. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to, to raise some observations, um, which will lead me to a question that will come in the end. Um, and maybe you can help me afterwards to, to answer this, this question. The, the observations are, we are all pedestrians, 
but we, women walk more. And we are all public transport users, but at least in Barcelona, 60% of, of those users are female, okay? Um, okay, if you can just pass the slides, okay. Um, for our grandparents or, or parents, it depends on our ages, um, cars were a symbol of progress. Um, my grandmother-in-law, which is Patrick's grandmother, she was from the Netherlands, and she used to remember the first time the uh, car entered her village, and it was the doctor's car. Okay? For our generation, cars mean are stuff that have been always at the public space, um, they have, we, we feel they have their right to be there because they always were there, okay? Um, well, and they used to be useful in, a, in, in our cities. Excuse me, because I, I was very... Um, but cars in Barcelona occupy 70% of our public space. And less than 25% of the trips are really done by cars. They take away at least 13 months of lives, of life expectancy in all the cities around the world. Uh, this is more than one year, this is uh, 400 days, okay? And cars in our cities are not efficient anymore. Uh, there, we have traffic jams, we have parking problems, they demand more and more space every time. And they also cause several accidents. But car users feel identified with, with, with their vehicle. Um, car is a part of their home. They, they can put their music there, they can shout there, they, they can uh, smoke there, they can eat snots there. I mean, it's really, um, yeah. And it's also kind of a zen space because while, while they are driving, they really have to concentrate on driving. So it's really the moment also to disconnect no, from the mobile phone and from anything else. And while they drive, they feel free. Even when they are in a traffic jam, they still feel free. So, um, yeah, as I was telling, uh, public space in Barcelona, 70% is for the cars, and public space is very scarce. scarce. Huge population density and a very small territory, only 100 uh, square kilometers. Uh, and main, main, mainly, this space is yeah, for parking and for driving cars. But we also need uh, a space for bike lanes. We also need space for bus lanes, for tram lanes. Um, and also places for people just to be there, not, not just walking, not, not just moving, but just being at, at, the, at, at the place and enjoying from being at, at the street, okay? And well, and this is this is democracy. I mean, democracy is giving all this space that is given just to 25% of the trips to the rest of the city, most, most of them women, okay? But even when everybody understands that uh, public transport is necessary and more bike lanes are necessary, it is very hard to take away this, this, this place that is taken by, by the car for the last 50, 60 years. And, and the car has the best place, the central place. I mean, in Barcelona, we've got uh, two tram lines. I don't know if you all know these two tram lines in Barcelona, this tram, in interruptus tram. It's lacking, the, the link m missing is just 3.5 kilometers. But it's, uh, it's in, in the middle of, of the city. It's the, the central space from the city, and it's taken from, from, from the car. And we, we are already for 15 years now with all the politicians are discussing about this connection. And it's so stupid because you see this, this uh, network here and this network there and just this central part is missing. Yeah. So the central pla place is for the car, for the individual, uh, and not to the public transport for the democratic use. So the question I, I wanted to raise is why we are not able of dedicating these best places for the sustainable and democracy mobility. Because we are all pedestrians, but only just a few of us are car users and car owners. And I don't know if these images were passing, but the idea, it was just showing that, yeah, this is, yeah, it's the same street, okay? Before and now, 
before and now? Before and now? And well, this is also this, this side. Before and after and now? Okay. Before, after, before, after. Before, after. And before, <laughs> after. Well, okay, that's all. Uh, two, days, two days ago, this super block was voted in the, at the district uh, with the politicians, and they voted to take this away, to go back to the situation with just cars or just nothing, just asphalt. So, well, this is a really big uh, thing we really have to cope with, and we hope you, you can help us to get ideas how to, how to arrange this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Silvia. Our next speaker is Javier Miranda. He is a guest speaker. He comes from Madrid, and I think he works in the for Aura Madrid in the town council. No, link to that. <laughs> ah, sí, sí. Um, we have uh, some issues with the computer again. Uh, hi. I am Javier from, from Madrid. And first thing, I was supposed to be a well English speaking woman, but it's just me. I'm so sorry. I'll do my, my very best uh, to make myself understand. And also, I celebrate a lot that I am the only man among the, the speakers, which is a really success from the, from the organization. Um, second disclaimer, uh, all, the city, all the cities of change, they are doing great efforts in, the, in every matter, but especially in, in mobility. So it's also worth to see what they are doing in Valencia, in Zaragoza, in Barcelona, in every one of those, street, of, of those cities. And uh, third disclaimer, uh, the recipes for improving mobility, they are well known. Like 40 years ago, they, we are not doing anything new. We know the, the recipes, uh, we just have to, to deal with the strategy, how to apply them. And apart from specifically things we are doing in, in Madrid, I'm trying to communicate uh, what we are learning on this process. And also, another disclaimer, uh, being audacious or fearless is, imp is important, but having a strategy is even more. It's the uh, first thing we have, to, we have to think. And the last one, uh, idea, mobility, have a lot to do with it, um, on how city shapes. Um, if, we see, if we look at every city in the world, if we uh, locate the main roads, we are going to see that the city spreads over these roads. They never spread random. They are so. This thing is important. Um, we have the idea of mobility has a lot to do with how the city shapes and, and develops. And next, just a brief context of, of Madrid is this one. So we can see uh, Madrid has the same uh, issues as every other city of big city in the in the world. We have a central area where uh, public transport is, um, I don't know, is the most used uh, method. And also we have a lot of cars going in and out every day. I think it's the scheme for every city in the, in the world. Um, after that, we have been asked uh, how we will define the situation of uh, mobility and pollution in, in Madrid. Uh, generically speaking, we'll say that we are trying to change. We are trying to change uh, from a classical uh, mobility paradigm to another, to a new one. And about air quality, uh, is this, this picture. Uh, we are pretty fucked up. There's no other way to say it. Because we are not 
um, complying with the with the pollution rates that the uh, World Health Organization uh, demands, but we are working on it, but uh, we have a lot of uh, inertia, cultural inertia and so on, and it's really uh, a challenge for us. Mm, for the first thing, also about uh, air quality, we have to say that uh, this is now on the, on the political debate, on the public debate, uh, mostly because uh, we are acting now. It's more is far easier not to do anything, just to keep breathing poison and uh, for the former um, government, it worked. They just do nothing and that's no, there's no problem. Now we are acting, now there's a huge debate, there's a lot of uh, problem on media and so on. Um, also, it's important if we speak about uh, air quality, it's like, um, obligated to speak also about the noise. They are always related, and it's a problem more or less the same, the same um, size, we are going to say. Oh. And if we speak about mobility, uh, we'll say that we are struggling between, do, uh, between two models. The classic paradigm with um, traffic jamming, Traffic is the issue, jamming is the problem, to a new paradigm, which is mobility and uh, pollution. Mobility is the, is the issue, because we now speak about moving people, not moving cars, that's important, and uh, the issue, the, the problem related, is the, is the pollution, what you have to solve. And uh, also about mobility, we have to think that there's different scopes of, the, of decision and they all affect the mobility in the, in the city. And this uh, draw I made, high technology, these municipal policies, they have, some, they have power. We, have, we can do a lot of things with municipal policies and this new citizen awareness about uh, contamination, about air pollution. But there's also this state and autonomic policies, uh, building new roads, these car renewal plans, uh, the lack of public transportation, how the land is used, and they will um, do a lot, a lot of, they put a lot of tension in the mobility problem, but from far uh, behind. They have a lot of power, and they don't, they don't deal with the problems. If the um, state builds a big road uh, heading for Madrid with a lot of cars, we are going to deal with these cars. They are going to say, no, we are solving this problem of mobility outside the city. What's happened inside the city is about, uh, it's a problem of municipality. And also very important, we have the cultural, cultural inertia and with what I have uh, uh, written as acquired rights. People, they think that is, um, moving with cars is something natural. They feel like something natural and they have a right to do it. And it's important to know we are going to act against uh, this. And also, last of, of this, uh, we have a lack of some concrete tools, uh, very necessary tools. For example, in Madrid, we don't have a, a sustainable mobility law. We don't have a financial uh, public transport financing law. Uh, we don't have them, and they are very specific tools. We need to change the, the situation. After that, uh, we were asked to tell more or less what we are doing in, in Madrid. First of all, I have to mention the first uh, activation of the high pollution protocol. It was like historical. Uh, it was uh, never uh, done in, in Madrid. Uh, we did it by the first time and it was surprising that the uh, massive uh, population compliance. They, people just uh, leave their cars in, the, in their homes and nothing, nothing else happens. And also we have this A plan, El Plan A, which is a, a plan that, that um, included some of the, these uh, classical recipes, but never done recipes, such as uh, this um, central area of uh, residential priority. So in this area of the city, this, this is the very center, um, foraging cars will be banned only uh, taxi service, residents, and so on. Um, this is a, a measure that um, have a lot of impact in the transit traffic, 
there was people crossing this area every day from here to here, they will be disappear with this uh, central area. And also it's an impact, it, it would have an impact not related or not uh, with income. Okay, um, it will affect either if you are poor or if you are rich. Oh, Ooh, dos minutos. Um, okay, so I'm moving fast. Uh, other thing, uh, redesign the main roads uh, to the city. These big roads, we are going to change them because this is cars going to the, uh, to the city and because these people have to live in a city, not in a, in a road. Um, other thing is to change these big roads, but inside the city. This is a, a street, uh, it's located in the very center, and we are moving from this scheme, these six um, lanes, to this one. It's an increment of the pedestrian space, some facilities to the bike, and only three lanes of, of traffic. And also, it's now with color. And what difficulties we have, found, we have um, affording with this A plan? The main, I would say, is the, the political debate is really muddy. It's not uh, rational. It's more in the, in the media. It's more um, on the feeling that on the numbers. And this is a problem. This is, a, the, I think, the main problem we, we have because the, the numbers are, are with us. We put this street and it works, and it works better for everyone. But um, the right party of the opposition, they are doing this speech all the time and only appealing to the, to the feeling, and they are uh, going against your right to move all over the city with your, with your car. And also to finish, I have some more, but uh, finish quickly. Uh, we are very proud on some low budget uh, specific action. This little action on some, some spots of the, of the city where you can, uh, where you move to, from this kind of street to this. You only ban um, the parking lane and city, uh, the, the thing will get better. And also this uh, thing, this is a Paseo del Prado on every day and this is Paseo del Prado on Sunday. Uh, which is important on, on this, and the, the Gran Vía experience will tell uh, us this, is important not to generate empty spaces. This is very important in our strategy, is doing that, because uh, if you have these acquired rights on going uh, with your car, this, if you want people from doing this, these people will not, uh, will not, cannot use this space anymore. It's a, a force, a huge force that will say, no, I want to do that. If you oppose that with nothing, with an empty space, with this uh, road but empty, there's nothing to do because this force will pass you over and there will nothing to do. You have opposed another big force and this big force for us is these people using the, the space. And I think there's enough. I had some more, but uh, later. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is, comes from Vancouver. She's Andrea Reimer, Councillor for Environmental Action in the, at the Vancouver City Council. Thank you. Um, so I am a woman who speaks English, uh, but I, uh, it's about 1.30 in the morning in my city, so I apologize if my English is not that coherent this morning. Um, so I'm here today, it's a pleasure to join you in Barcelona to talk a bit about Vancouver's experience in greening transportation. Um, at first, though, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Vancouver, so you'll have some context for it. In Canada, well, in all of Canada, we have four orders of government. In my province, we have five orders of government. So we have the national government, and then we have the provincial government, like a state government. 
Uh, this, the provincial has the most power in Canada. It has a lot of power. Below that, we have a regional government. Then we have a city government. Uh, and then uh, some complexity around Indigenous governments who sort of exist at all levels. And the court is still figuring out uh, the rights and title of First Nations governments. Um, so Vancouver is one of 21 cities in the Metro Vancouver region. It's the third largest metropolitan area in Canada at 2.5 million. Uh, at night, Vancouver has about 650,000 people who sleep in the city of Vancouver. By maybe noon the next day, we're closer to 1.5 million people who come in from around the region to go to school or work or they travel through on their way to the university. Um, the challenge is they don't bring their own roads or garbage cans or water and the city has to figure out how to pay for all these things even though we receive no revenue from these individuals. Uh, we're also the unceded traditional homeland of three indigenous governments and we work with them on a government to government uh, relationship while they uh, work through the courts on their title. We have an English as a second language population that's over 50%. The biggest language groups in Vancouver are Cantonese first, then Mandarin, Punjabi, Vietnamese, Tagalog, the Filipino language, Spanish is the sixth language, Arabic and then French and then many other languages uh, the, from around the world. Poverty is at about 21% in Vancouver, and more than half of our residents pay more than 30% of their incomes to housing. And we have the province with the lowest minimum wage in Canada, so it's a very, for everybody, it's a very challenging environment, except for the very top people in the, in the income level. So in 2009, we uh, decided that we, we have a number of goals. My government was first elected in 2008 uh, on four platform areas, one of which was to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. I bring this up because I think uh, one of the things we've learned is that you can fight over one bike lane or you can fight over a bike plan or you can fight to be the greenest city in the world. It's all the same size of fight, so why not take the big fight uh, or the big vision that you're fighting for? It's been a very successful policy for us for four reasons. Um, the first is leadership, having a leader who leads, somebody with a capital letter like mayor or premier or prime minister or president um, who is willing to be the leader for the initiative is critical for transformative change. The second is having a plan, which sounds simple. Um, it's not, but we have a saying that some is not a number and soon is not a time, that you need to have very clear targeted metrics and a very clear timeline on which you're reporting out on them. In our case, we have 10 broad goal areas with 17 metrics that we have an annual report on every year. It's mandatory. It's a, a law in Vancouver that it must be reported out on. Uh, we also have a lot of public engagement. The plan was crowdsourced through 35,000 residents, so about 5% of our population was actively engaged in building the plan. They went to meetings every week, every month, over the period of two years to develop it. Uh, and about 180 different civil society organizations, academics, business groups, labor unions uh, were also engaged in it. So the result of that is that on any given day, um, the city itself has done over 150 policy initiatives related to the greenest city plan uh, but on any given day we will have uh, hundreds of resident and organization led actions also happening in addition to the work that the city itself is doing which is why we've gotten such positive results on it when we started the plan we were not even in the rankings globally they only rank the top 500 cities uh, we're now the fourth greenest city on earth under the Global Green Index and the third in the Economist Intelligence Unit ranking. Uh, of the, well, you can see the stats there. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the GHGs, uh, which during the, the period of this plan, we had a prime minister for most of the plan whose name was Stephen Harper and was globally considered to be a climate criminal um, for the policies that he took on environment. So to say that in the plan, we reduced our GHGs 15% during the time he was Prime Minister. Uh, per capita, it was closer to 22% because our population is growing quite quickly, as is our economy as a result of investments in green jobs. Uh, and Canada's national average per person is 15 tons. Vancouver's at 3.9. So it shows you the power of what cities can do, um, despite having terrible national leadership. Ah, and three of the 17 targets have already been achieved, including both of the transportation targets. So I'll focus a bit on those. 
Uh, so the reason we've been very successful at the transportation uh, is because we have made it not so much about the environment. It's definitely an environmental issue, but it is a whole bunch of other issues. So it's an affordability issue. These people pay 10% of what the average transit user does during the month and about 2% of what the average car driver does during the month. So in a city where housing costs are such a huge pressure, um, the right to active trans safe active transportation is a critical issue of affordability. It's also a fairness issue. You can see that the cars have their own space, the pedestrians have the sidewalks, which is their own space. Uh, but until we had the, oh, sorry, even transit has its own space, the rapid transit, but until we had the separated bike lanes, the bikes have to fight on the sidewalks or on the roads or on the tramways to try and find a safe space to go. Uh, in Vancouver, it is a, a simple physics issue. Uh, we have a river to the south, an ocean to the north, and we have a uh, university on one side and a uh, city on the other, so we have nowhere to grow. There is no new land that we can build roads on. Uh, we are only growing our buildings up, and we cannot build our transportation up, practically speaking. Uh, so we need to figure out how we use the road more efficiently. And we know that, I don't know how well you can see this, but you can see this is how much room it takes to move 60 people by road. So the bus is about that much, the bike is not so much, and the cars take up a lot of room. And we just simply don't have the room in Vancouver. It's not just about bikes. The biggest chunk of active mobility in Vancouver is pedestrians, and it's because we've really focused on pedestrian safety. Uh, the top, what we did is we took a million dollars and we went to the top 10 intersections for fatalities and uh, injury and we invested it in infrastructure and made those the safest 10 intersections in the city. Then we took the next 10 and the next 10 and so on. So as it gets simpler to walk, you see people um, who traditionally might have driven with children or elderly parents suddenly finding walking to be the best way to get around. Um, it's not just about pedestrians because if you're a transit user, unless you've convinced the city to put the stop right outside your door, you're also a pedestrian because you need to walk to be able to get to the, the transit stop. We also plan the city around making walking uh, comfortable and enjoyable. We uh, have issues in that we are a very multicultural society, so social integration is a very big issue for us. We know that when people walk, they're five times more likely to have positive social interactions than when they're driving, so it's a critical issue to find ways to get them talking. Um, the cool thing is, is that because we need less parking spaces, because less people are driving, this uh, seating area was a parking space, and now it's a space for people to connect when they're walking. Less parking spaces means even less people drive because they have trouble find parking and maybe they'll walk to you. Some of it can be very simple, just like making sure that they have access to water when they're walking around the city. We, uh, if I was caught with a bottle of water at home, I would be in big trouble. So I've been trying to avoid, um, trying to avoid being taken pictures. We have a very big initiative to drink clean water out of the city's supply of water. And um, we also take advantage of opportunities. I was on the no side of uh, the referendum around the Olympics. We lost that referendum very narrowly. Uh, but when we had the Olympics, we said, okay, what can we do to leverage some positive things? So during the Olympics, we closed down 50% of the road capacity into downtown Vancouver because it was needed for security and crowds and other things. Uh, so people said, oh my God, I'm going to have to do something different. So they started taking transit. Uh, and of the people who took transit, over a million people, we've been able to retain 25% of them to continue to take transit because they had a safe, positive experience doing it. Uh, we also are uh, very big on the positive sharing economy. We have the largest car share per capita in the world. Uh, so for each car that is shared, uh, 15 private cars are no longer owned. So 45,000 cars have been taken off the roads in Vancouver as a result of the car share program that we have. We also have a bike share program that's specifically geared towards residents. If you come to Vancouver to visit, do not plan on taking the bike share. It's very expensive for visitors to use each day uh, because the idea is to make it more affordable for residents. So I pay $100 a year to use the unlimited bike share. If you're a tourist, you would pay about $15 a day to use it.
Uh, and the last thing is electric vehicles. Some people will have to drive for whatever reason and goods movement. We now have the largest deployment of electric vehicle stations and largest electric vehicle ownership per capita in North America. And because our hydroelectricity is 97% emissions free, it's a po for us it's a positive thing. If you were burning coal or garbage, I would not suggest electrifying your transportation grid. So the last idea I wanted to leave you with, uh, even if we're very good at what we do, we're not immune to the impacts of climate change. This is downtown Vancouver in June 2015, so two years ago. Uh, and the smoke in the air is not from cars or industry, it's from wildfires burning all around the city because of a drought. Uh, so we also have a national government that is, even though they've changed and are more positive, uh, still very aggressive on the idea of increasing heavy oil shipments through the port of Vancouver. They'd like to build a pipeline that would increase it by sevenfold, uh, and the residents of Vancouver are extremely opposed to this concept. So we got sick of fighting against it. We still do. We have court cases and protests and many actions that we've been taking to try and stop the pipeline. Uh, but we also wanted to be able to catalyze a positive movement for something. So in 2015, we made an initiative to go 100% renewable energy over the, the coming years uh, because we really believe that the only way we're ever going to get if we stop this pipeline, there'll be another pipeline and another pipeline. There'll always be new proposals. But we feel that if we could kill the global market for oil, then perhaps we could kill all of these, uh, these things that are coming forward for proposals. So it's why, it's why I'm here in Barcelona. It's why we made the initiative. It's why we've worked very hard internationally um, to try and get more cities on board the 100% renewable initiative. Last, last thing I'll say, there's a quote from Henry Ford, who's sort of the the father of industrialism, automobile industrialism, where a reporter asked him about cars. The reporter said, do people want these things? Funny now, right, to think about that moment. Uh, and he said, no, what people want are faster horses, but I can't make a faster horse, and this is what I can do for them. So I can't make more land for roads, I can't make driving cheaper, I can't make it safer, I'm not willing to be unfair, but I can make a city where people can walk safely, where it's affordable for them, where there's fair distribution of road space and pedestrian space and transit space for people, and give the planet a better chance at survival as a result of that. So thank you for having me here today. Our last uh, speaker from our panel is Janet Sanz. Janet is the fifth, let's see if I say it, deputy mayor of the uh, urban, um, ecology, I mean, maybe she can say it better. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Maranta. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for us that you've been here and we can talk about our challenge, um, in this case, for the fight against uh, air pollution and the problems of this air pollution. I'm, uh, I'm Janet, I'm a deputy mayor right now uh, for ecology, urbanized and mobility of City Council of Barcelona. Oh, I, uh, uh, we have a short time to explain our policies and it's very important for us uh, to listen to you. Uh, let me introduce the context to understand our policies, actual policies in the City Council. Over the last 10, 20 years, um, air pollution levels have been higher than WHO um, suggested limits. And despite, despite this, in fa this fact, Barcelona's local government uh, has not been active in developing uh, air pollution uh, measures. In addition, uh, we lost 20 years of economical crisis, and now uh, the economical situation, the economic situation is starting, is starting to change. And there is an important risk that this is the situation gets worse if, if we don't act urgently. Our current situation is bad because over 97% of the population is exposed 
to, to air pollutants over WHO limits. As a consequence, in our city, every year uh, there are more than 600 premature deaths, uh, deaths uh, caused by air pollution, and, and it has been demonstrated that current high pollution levels have a negative uh, impact on child cognitive, cognitive develop, development. And for, for us, this is unacceptable. Our transport, I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't share with you uh, some information of our system of transport. And Barcelona's tra private transport use is by far the main source uh, of air pollution emissions. Commuters to Barcelona from metropolitan area uh, are compromised 45% of the private transport used in Barcelona, while the other 50%, 55% sorry, are internal trips. And if we analyze Barcelona's transport from a gender perspective, uh, we have to talk about gender imbalance. Uh, let's, make, let's make it clear. Women, women are less responsible for the current population levels because we have a greater use of sustainable models of mobility. While 25% of trips by men uh, are done by motorized, motorized private transport, and this figure decreases to 15% in the case of women. On the other hand, 33% of trips by women are done by public transport, while this figure decreases to 25% in the case for men. If we manage to move from the current situ situation to, to a less polluting public and active transport, everybody will win. And we will, we will have less pollution for all. And we will be able to free public space, gaining it from cars for the benefit of, of, of the people in general, and for leisure and for green spaces, for example. But if we continue with the current situation, everybody loses. But women are the losers with less responsibility. This is an injustice, clear an injust injustice, which is also very clear for the other groups, such as kids or the elderly. In Barcelona, maintaining this, uh, the current mobility mode with the existing air pollution problem is not only a health and environmental problem, it is clearly an environmental and gender injustice, like I said. This is the reason why since we, come, uh, we have come to the government, uh, we have been working to set uh, air pollution problems as a top priority in the political and public agenda. In order to be successful, we need to scale up this problem in our local agenda, but also in the municipalities agenda that surround us, as well as another administration, la, like a regional administration agenda and the state administration agenda. It is very important to understand that we cannot uh, solve the problem alone uh, because air does, uh, does not un understand administrative barriers. We need all administrations, we need everybody on board for fight against uh, this problem, for fight uh, the air pollution. This is why we are working, uh, working with them and lobbying them <laughs> from the city council, for example, to stop subsidizing diesel, diesel cars or to improve the current controls over the car industry uh, in order to avoid uh, another diesel gate, for example. And we will continue to try to push, uh, uh, to push for a concerted action against the, the air pollution problem with them. But of course, <laughs> if we want to lead, uh, first, uh, first of all, we also uh, have to take our own responsibility inside Barcelona. With this objective, last November, we presented our program of anti-air pollution measures, 2016-2020, that include more or less uh, 50 different measures. I'm not going to, into the details, uh, <laughs> because you can find our plan, action plan uh, in Catalan, in Spanish, in English, on our website. But I want to briefly share with you three ideas concretely. First of all, we are setting policies to make private vehicles 
harder to move and park inside our city, inside Barcelona. For example, we are implementing pacification actions in different streets and the super blocks strategy, like I said before uh, Silvia, because we think we need a new uh, way to organize our public space. In second, um, in second half, we are promoting non-pollution and public transport in high traffic uh, areas. And for example, we want to achieve uh, 300 kilometers of bike lanes in our city. Now, uh, we already have implemented more or less uh, 75 seven kilometers of new, new 75 kilometers. And finally, we are going to make it more difficult for polluting vehicles to move inside Barcelona. And for this time in Barcelona, uh, we'll have a low emission zone that will come into force in, in the next uh, December. At the same time, we are transforming our city, Barcelona, in a, green, in a greener city. In conclusion, anti-air pollution policies are a top priority for us in a government that has a very big commitment to move from the benefit of a few to the common goods, a commitment to defending the right to housing, because it's our priori priority, top priority, promoting the right to live in a healthy and livable neighborhoods, transforming from gray to green, and making the, the, the naturalization of the city possible, and promoting a new mobility and energy transition. We are, we are going to fight the air pollution problem because our final objective is clear. We want to lead a transition toward a feminist, green, and fair, and fair city where the right to breathe clean air, air is possible. The challenge is big, I know, we know, but, and we know too the, the resistance are very big too, uh, industry and some citizens, but our will is very bigger too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Janet. Uh, so we are going to start the second part. I'm going to remind you what this, this is about, especially because some people entered afterwards. Uh, we are going to have now, uh, now the, the idea is that the people in the audience can share their comments, experiences, their knowledge, their ideas uh, with each other. And we are going to do this through a series of questions that we are going to put forward. These questions are in three blocks, are divided in three blocks. And at the end of each block, some, some of our speakers will also say something about that topic. So uh, in order to facilitate this thing, this, uh, this second part, I already told you, we have some hand signals in place. So I'm going to ask you to, to just, I mean, if you, I'm, I'm, I'm making you an exam. So if you want to talk, what do you do? You raise a hand. Can you all raise your hand? just to see if you understand my English. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you agree with what is being said, what do you do? You move your hand. This is very encouraging for the person who's speaking. I mean, it's more for that person like, yeah, I agree with you. I'm totally with you. And uh, if you're talking too much, I will do this. And then you should stop speaking. And then another person can talk. Eh? No what? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, we will grateful, appreciate interventions that are not going beyond two minutes or something like that. So, yeah, try to facilitate yourself, but otherwise I'll, I'll be here <laughs> to do it. So, the first block of uh, questions are, like, some of our speakers have talked about resistances. Like, I mean, the, the problem is clear. The solution have been known for many, many years. And now there is a will to implement and to change uh, how cities are built. And many times there's a lot of resistance, a lot of debate, and, and a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of opposition to these ideas, no? So it's about, uh, it's about the change of the model, the change of model of cities, the change of model of mobility, and also the cultural change that it's necessary 
to change the, the dominant view of the power of the car in the cities. So the first questions that we would like to throw to you, and you can pick up any of them or you know whatever you, you feel, and are how do we imagine this new model? And what kind of dominant practices and ideas we have to give up in order to embrace this change of paradigm? Um, what type of, what, what, are, what is the role of electric cars? What are the, the, the strengths and the challenges or the difficulties of, or the problems of electric cars and the motorbikes, uh, as well as the, the limits and the possibilities of the car sharing schemes? We would really like that you talk from your experience. Maybe you are campaigners, maybe you work in, 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 in town councils, or, and you for sure are citizens of cities that you are experiencing certain structure of mobility that you, are, you, you live in. So the floor is open. I don't know how to do with this. This is a, an issue. Uh, I'm not sure if this can be moved, or you just have to stand up and talk very loud. Que se lo vayan pasando? Okay. Es que no se puede. Está pegado. Okay. Es que es muy difícil, eh, por ahí. Ah, vale. I can repeat the question. I can no, but no, it's not the, because it's not a question, it's a comment. I'm not going to repeat the comment. Um, vale. You give, you give the, the yeah. words to the poll? So, I, do you want to repeat the question? If you want to inspire you. Uh, how do we imagine this new model of mobility in cities, this change of paradigm? What type of uh, dominant practices and ideas as a society we have to give up to embrace this new uh, this paradigm shift? Um, what are the goals? What are the debates around these cars, electric cars? Yeah. Okay, I, I think there is an issue that is not, uh, it's, it's overseen, but for me is uh, extremely important and is a, a great paradox. If you just go to the street, you look how many people in a car, you hardly find more than two. I think the average is 1.4. So, I mean, this is the most crazy thing for me. Like, the car is 800 kilograms, it moves at 50 kilometers per hour, and it takes six or seven square meters, just the car, and just to transport one or one and a half persons. So I wonder, uh, the, 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 the most important thing probably is this, that it, it's, it's not fair. It's not fair that one person uses so much space in, in a car. And if simply policies that uh, tackle this issue and so promote carpooling, which I haven't heard this word in all presentations, they could just simply just with the, all the rest being the same, nothing, nothing changes, just simply impose that in a city no more than, uh, uh, no less than Three person can be in a car, for instance. So we basically, we can half the number of cars because instead of one and a half person per car, you have three person per car or four or five. And I think this would be just a simple measure that uh, could be implemented. And I, I, I think the, 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 there is the need to create a narrative like this and policymakers also to, to enforce policies that goes in this direction. I'm Claudio Cattaneo from Barcelona. I am, I am also Mark from Barcelona. Yes, <coughs> sorry, uh, I had the mic. I am Mark uh, from Barcelona as well, uh, but I, I don't want to touch that much in, in Barcelona. I want to touch in my experience living in, in Asia, in 20 million people cities, uh, which are totally differently designed. I think we are, uh, in this presentation, the only mention was in Janet's title, uh, 
this is essentially, for me, related to urbanism, how, how we design our cities. And, and take the example of the cities in Japan. The, the, city cent the, the center of the neighborhood in Japan is the station. It's not a shopping mall or it's not a road, it's the station. And people move by train and by metro because the cities are designed around, the, the, or the neighborhoods are designed around the stations. And I think this is, a, this is something that we are, uh, we are missing in this whole picture. Uh, we, we are talking about transportation, but we are sort of reacting to a, to a car-centric model of urbanism. And uh, this is simply not, not sustainable. We cannot put, uh, if we live in, 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 in apartment, in, sorry, in small villas, we cannot put a transit that, go, that stop every, for one person. This is not sustainable. Then we are going to be linked to cars and to private transportation. And, and I think this is something that I would like other people to, to, to discuss as well. I'm going to stand up because I think uh, people will hear me better. Yeah, <laughs> I'll try, okay? Uh, my name is Pablo Valerio. I live here in Barcelona. Uh, five years ago, we moved from Boston to Barcelona. I'm originally from the city, but I lived many years in the US. And one of the things that was basically uh, surprising to me is all these issues about parking. Parking in this city is a complete disaster. And this is something that in many, many ways, we do have to address. The first thing is motorcycles. How come the motorcyclists can use the sidewalks? I mean, this is something, I mean, unthinkable. It's just one of the, and this is one of the most important part, uh, policies that you, we can actually use to reduce traffic in a city. If we manage parking, we eliminate all the free parking in the city, which is over 50%, on sidewalk parking and, you know, curbside parking. This will actually make a real impact very soon. We don't, I mean, the super blocks are a great idea. I'm up for it. This is one of the most interesting uh, programs that the city is actually putting forward. But I think this is going to take a very, very long time. And one of the things that I think uh, policymakers have to take in, in consideration is that these 600 people dying you know, mm, every year in Barcelona because of pollution, which they count about m over 3,500 in the metropolitan area, should be treated as an emergency, not something that we have to, you know, address in the future. So free parking is very expensive parking. This is my idea of uh, how they can address the situation. Regulate all the parking in the city, Put, and the fact that you know, people can actually pay a couple of euros, a resident, to park the car on the street for three months and not moving it is another disaster. Hello, my name is Laura Gracia. I'm from Richmond, California. Woo. <laughs> um, so I appreciate, you know, uh, the gender imbalance. Another thing I wanted to highlight is, at least in my community, it's also a racial and a socioeconomic imbalance. Um, one of our community, or a, a major part of our community is nestled in between two major freeways. They're downwind of the Chevron refinery, which is the largest refinery on the West Coast. Um, and so it's not, it's not just this aspect of single drivers, it's um, the city planning. And so I really appreciate the idea of super blocks. Um, so one of the things that we're doing is we're moving towards a just transition. And what that means is working with our community, finding out what our community needs, because as the person from Vancouver said, we have a very diverse community and we need to make sure that we remember that they're the experts in our community. They're the ones that have lived there the longest. They're the ones that know everything about their community and they're the ones that should be making the decisions and should be at the front line of all of this because they are. 
that's their imbalance. They're the ones that are breathing in all the toxic air. So I, I also just wanted to highlight that, at least in my community in the US, it's a racial and a socioeconomic issue as well. Yeah, uh, okay. I'm, yeah, maybe it's better if I, okay, sorry my English is not really good. I'm Luisa from uh, Madrid, and I'd like to, to ask two things to Barcelona and Vancouver about uh, the, the issues that we are living in Madrid with the change in mobility. I think uh, uh, the issues is about uh, the uh, uh, speech from the, the opposition, because uh, we are uh, um, uh, see the, the numbers about uh, uh, mobility and women, and uh, we have uh, the opposition that said that for the women is a problem uh, stop the the cars in the city because the women need uh, the cars for go to the school with the children and uh, to do the the things that and then the work and then and there are not time for transport public to do all the things that a women have to do. And in fact, it's, it's false because <laughs> the, the women, you, you see, don't use the, the car so much. But I think we have this problem about the, the symbol, no? and, and in, in, in el discurso, in, in discourse. And the other thing is about uh, our own people uh, in the organization and, and the people. Uh, because um, we have the, the, the symbol that as a car, as a change of class. No? It's a, like a position. And they said, uh, if, if you raise the taxes about uh, pollution and on the cars, the cars will be only for rich people. And I like to, to have a car as well. No? And, and I, the two things that I think is really problem is the, the woman speech and the class speech and we can, uh, how can we change that? Hi, I'm David uh, from a grassroots movement in France, in Grenoble. Uh, ah, I'm David from a grass... <laughs> yes, but I, I, I need my note, but... Uh, so, from a grassroots movement, a popular uh, workshop of urbanism in a popular neighborhood in France, in my city in Grenoble. Uh, I think uh, uh, um, we need act on concrete projects and share experiences like on what we are doing today. It's good, but I think we need a second thing. Um, we need a multi-level campaign of advocacy to change the legislation at the various level, municipal, metropolitan, national, European, international. So we need a, a campaign. So maybe today could be a, an important day because we could create a network and create an agenda to um, have a campaign about mobilities, new mobilities. So I suggest to uh, continue the debate and maybe to find some events in the next month, weeks, uh, weeks, month or, or years to, to continue a political agenda. We need to elaborate a political agenda with really good uh, uh, proposal and concrete project sure in OCT but also proposal. And uh, in September, uh, we, are, we will organize an event in Grenoble about creative mobilities. Uh, so it could be a, a, a second step. And in Madrid, in October, the European Common Assembly will organize also an event about, about uh, urban commons. And maybe the issue of mobilities could be uh, part of the discussion with the group who are in the room, just uh, uh, the, um, this room, just here. So uh, I have information here about the event in Grenoble, and we could continue to, to share, to elaborate this agenda, not just 
share experiences, but also elaborate an agenda. Thank you. Change your blog, no? Thank you. Uh, my name is Yannick. I am from Copenhagen. Um, I think that, it, well, thank you for some really interesting points and really nice hearing about some more experiences. Because people, could you close the door? Just every time there's noise. Um, so I think one thing about mobility I haven't heard mentioned is this question of time traveling in between places because there's a, as you've mentioned from the USA, there's a, a social economic element uh, or racialized element as well. Um, it is that it's actually often very, very difficult to get from working class neighborhood to working class neighborhood. Uh, at least even in Copenhagen where I'm from, but also having lived in London. I know it's the same thing in Paris. So I was thinking how, uh, well, Barcelona and Vancouver, in Madrid as well, how do you deal with this question of making, well, not just, if you like it, more green, uh, focused around the bike or, or pedestrian, but how do you think this question of mobility into between places and if public transportation is the solution, how do you prevent it from becoming a gentrification machine, which it is in the case of Copenhagen, because it was exclusively made, the metro line was exclusively made to put up rent prices, which puts us poor people out of neighborhoods. So it's not until recently we've got a circle line connecting different neighborhoods. But how do we prevent this aspect of it? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. I'm Peter from uh, Antwerp, Belgium, uh, from uh, City Council. I have some questions. Uh, in Antwerp, uh, there is uh, a big ha harbor, a big industry. So I was, uh, and and that causes 90% uh, of pollution in Antwerp city comes still from industry. So I was uh, uh, wondering, because in the beginning they were said the new uh, pollution in the cities is mainly from cars, but maybe Antwerp is an exception, uh, but I think there are still uh, some industries around uh, cities. So uh, there is a question, for example, for Vancouver, uh, what measures do they take vis-a-vis uh, -vis the industry uh, to prevent pollution? Secondly, there is a, a lot of problem in Antwerp, in our city, from working areas, working class areas, to the workspace. Because there is uh, almost non-public transport to the docks, to the, the harbor, to the petrochemical factories, uh, and, and that's a big problem. And how on a city level uh, can one cope when uh, the, uh, the public transportation level is decided on a higher level, it's, it's a problem. Because on a higher level they are doing all these economies and they're making it more and more difficult. And how can we cope, uh, of how do you cope in Barcelona, Madrid, other cities, when the decision making of tra public transport is on another level? Uh, and then the last thing I, I wanted to say, like in Antwerp, they, the majority, they introduced a low emission zone. But because there is no, uh, almost non-alternative uh, with public transport, there is no uh, public uh, involvement, public support. Uh, it, because I think you can only uh, introduce measures like uh, low emission zones when you have sufficient uh, alternatives to get to the workplace, etc. Otherwise, it becomes that the cars, they will stay, but they will pay. Those that uh, want to go to work and they can afford to pay, they will uh, continue to have to the cars. And the other ones, uh, there is no alternative. That were uh, three questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh. Um, I'm going to change a little bit the dynamic because I see that many people have want to talk and, 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 and contribute to the conversation. So I'm going to just throw all the questions that we had from all the blogs, destroy the idea of the blogs, you, you keep the questions in case they are inspiring for you or in case you want to share your experience of your city or the problems you face in, one, in some of the aspects that have been presented and as it has been happening right now, just do it. So um, 
the the other two blocks were re were related one to this kind of the uh, the, the, the the contribution of uh, this uh, person that was talking about the role that the urbanism plays in within the within the cities and within to 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 tackle uh, air pollution. So this is about the what what type of um, the role of the zones such as superblock zones, and also uh, the role that an organized society that is engaged in the in this uh, in favor of this uh, mobility change, the role of that engaged society have also in order to, to push forward this, these new changes. Um, other questions are about the role of congestion charts, problems, uh, advantages of this kind of, uh, of policies, um, and other policies like speed limits, that's something that is known in some cities as 20 is plenty. Um, and also these things that people have been raising about inequalities, no? to what extent and can this uh, create new e these, uh, inequalities between different groups within the society and how do we prevent these things. Um, so I'm going to just continue with the, with the words that uh, people were raising their hands. Just continue and I will take your turn. Uh, hello, I am from Brazil, so the problems of mobility and air pollution in our cities are much worse than we see here, and we have a very different reality. And uh, one of these cases, the toler tolerance for air pollution in our Ministry of Health is the double of uh, uh, here and World Wealth Organization. And uh, we have a very high bus fare. And for example, a medium worker in Brazil have to work something like 20 minutes to pay a bus fare. And uh, comparing to cities in Europe, it's something like five minutes or six minutes or eight or 10 minutes. And um, because mobility and public transport in Brazil become a, a, a very, uh, very good business for some very rich people that explore that. And then we, so we have a very chaotic situation, Uber arriving in Brazil as a solution for people that going to go out, want to go out of this precarious uh, public transport system. And uh, with this very high bus fare, we have some movements uh, in opposition of that for free public transport. And I think this can be also a issue, something to talk about, free public transport as a way to improve public transport use. And uh, just remember that in Paris, when they have a very high problem of uh, air pollution, one of the solutions in two or three years ago was to make five days of free public transport in the metro, in the bike share and everything. And I think it's a contribution of social movements in Brazil and the uh, issue that uh, I think we could debate. Vale. Um, I'm, I'm American, but I've lived um, more than half my life outside of my country, and uh, I've lived 16 years in Catalonia. And, um, and I actually, I run an NGO that we work on conserving biodiversity and uh, offsetting climate change. And with that, I work in rural development and how that can influence transport into our urban areas and lower the emissions of human um, human emissions in rural areas so that our natural resources can actually offset the emissions created in our urban counterparts. And one of the big things um, that we push for is basically um, 
creating um, more sustainable economies in our community so that the 45% of the people that have to come into the bigger urban areas don't have to. There's actually economies in development and we produce goods that are also um, easily transportable in a radius. So it lowers emissions, um, it increases um, you know, the economic possibilities for a wide range of people because the people in my village, the average income is 1,000 euros a month for a family of four. So it, it, you know, the issue isn't always just transport or lowering in emissions in, in a city, but it's also looking about the outside influences and how we can collectively work to lower those, um, those transmissions. And one is uh, producing goods locally and also creating sustainable jobs so people don't have to come and work for bigger infrastructures. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Maria Jose. We are coming from La Laguna, Tenerife. We are now in the opposition, but maybe in 2019 we, can, we have the possibility to, to, uh, to be in the, in the power. But, uh, I, I, no, it's true, it's the only city in Tenerife that in the moment we have the possibility. So th I'm going to explain why I'm telling that. I listen all the... Um, all the possibilities that you have, and we are very interesting. But I'm asking: in Tenerife is an island, everybody knows. So if you make all this change only in a city, you cannot move in the island. People need the car because the public transport in Tenerife is not uh, so good. So you cannot uh, go to the north, to the south uh, very fast. Um, a lot of uh, small towns are not good communicate. You can take even, I don't know, five hours for go in a place that you, by car you take, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes maximum. So if you, if you tax the possibility to park to the people, I have a question. Where the people are going to put the car? Because they need the car to move in the island. And we are far, far away to have the power in the, in all, in the Tenerife or the or Canarias. So we are not to put the, the mobility, sus, um, mobility sustainability, sorry for my English, in the, in, the, in the island. Because people who are in the power now, Coalición Canaria, PP or PSOE, is not, they are not interesting because it's not uh, a politic uh, um, for the people. People, people, uh, people, needs a lot of education about it. So my question is, we cannot do in, in, a, in a place like a La Laguna all this change without the rest of the change on the, on the network of the transport public. I, I can explain myself. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Elvira from uh, City. I'm Elvira from City Council of uh, Zaragoza, and I think it's something I wanted to say. Something uh, maybe it's related to to the last question because I think it's very important to uh, if we, if we want to change the model, we have to uh, make the the planning uh, from all points of view. We we can just go through uh, through transport. We we need to go through town planning, we need to go to environment, we need, we need to change all the models. So not just thinking in, in, uh, in this kind of issues, we have to think all, all the issues together. Because if we just uh, respond to now, as the city is right now, we respond to the, to the transport and we change the model of transport without changing, for example, our commercial uh, costumes or our um, where are the services in cities or uh, even uh, our sense of, uh, of need of uh, property, we can't, uh, we can't make a big change. We can make uh, this uh, possible. What? <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Hao. I'm from Barcelona. Uh, yes. Uh, my name is Hao. I'm from Barcelona. Uh, I want to talk about the issue that I haven't listened here. I've listened a lot of good ideas, but 
uh, one of the important things for me to improve the mobility uh, in a city is to reduce the mobility, to reduce the, di the distance me people have to move. Then I think uh, a very important thing the, go the local government has to do is to um, contribute uh, to the uh, the the local the, the near um, um, commercial places um, do uh, to make policies to not to um, polarize the city like uh, supporting uh, big commercial areas so people ha that creates a lot of of, uh, of mobility then. I think an important thing to do is to reduce the mobility. Hi. Uh, okay. <laughs> Oops. Okay, I, I'm Irene, I'm from Madrid, and at the end, I think that uh, the main goal for us is to go to a, a city, reproduction city, not ver versus or against productive city. At the end, I think that is the, for me, is one of the conclusions in the in the workshop. And also, uh, for 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 me, it's, be, it's very nice to to know that many um, cities in, uh, in many cities are thinking the same way. At the end, in Madrid, we are trying to implement a new. Uh, zero area, zero emission, zero, zero emission area, and for us it's been very difficult because the opposition parties are trying to do <laughs> the most difficult things. So uh, I think that the conclusion is that reproduction, uh, where reproduction city, where people can make uh, their own lives. quickly recover some of them back. So if, if you can, our guest speakers, maybe you can give some answers. So um, there was uh, that guy who was talking about what to do where, where your competence has a limit as a city. You know, if you have higher instances that rule over a city, how you, how you deal with that, you know? What kind of things can you do? Uh, there was other people who were talking about, well, uh, of course, we, how do you manage the the challenge, uh, the, the threat of uh, gentrifying and increasing inequalities within the city by changing these mobility schemes. How can you uh, take care of these things? Um, there was also this girl who was talking about what, what about cities that have idiosyncratic uh, elements such as uh, islands, cities in islands that have, uh, and, and cities that what about the context of the city? What about if the context doesn't change? Uh, what are the possibilities of changing a city? So, I mean, these are many questions. Uh, you, you, uh, you cannot, you won't be able to answer all, but maybe you can say something. Uh, Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions there. Um, so a few things I would say um, broadly. Mm, you know, we weren't supposed to speak so much about designing cities, but the question of who designs cities and how cities are designed is a critical question. Land use and transportation are inseparable issues. Um, so the gentleman from Sweden, my answer would be, sorry, Denmark, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, your problem isn't that, um, in my opinion, that transit is gentrifying, it's that people of color and in, in my continent indigenous people are displaced from the center and then they're displaced from there and then they keep being displaced. So the problem isn't that transit is coming, it's that there's no policy to present, prevent displacement generally speaking and I'd be interested to get them back to the center. Similarly, the woman who asked about um, 
you know, you made the point women uh, have a lot to do during the day, which as a mother I understand, um, and then maybe we need to drive. But I would argue that schools and shopping and work should all be within walking or easy trans, like build better cities and then you don't have this problem so much. And how do you do that? Um, you elect more feminists to government and you get more feminists. And I'm deliberately saying feminist, not women, because I'm elected with a council that's half women, it, they're not half feminists. So um, there's more men who are feminists on my council than there are women. So it, it, yeah, we have to think that through. Um, there's a lot of things people talked about that I would say is about unnorming it. The first gentleman who spoke about the road space budget, like it's just so crazy that we assume one mode of transportation gets 80% of the space and the rest of us are just gonna huddle in the other 20%, right? And it's so normed. We have more people, who die globally in the US, way more people who die from automobiles than die from guns, and yet that's never on the news, right? And if you add in the pollution from the automobiles, it's exponentially a hundred factor magnitude of the gun deaths that we're so focused on. Not that we shouldn't be worried about those, but we never, we've so normed it. If you took out a mortgage on the number of square meters you need to park a car in the city. So this is your workplace parking, your housing parking, your on-street parking. It's enough to buy a house in the city of Vancouver. And it's why my point about efficiency, but it's so normed in our heads that cars just deserve this space and we need to fight that. Uh, last two things I would say, there are many things in life that should be public. Water definitely is one of them, publicly owned transport and healthcare. Absolutely, it's been our biggest allies in Canada is having the healthcare system on our side. Um, and there is a specific question about industry pollution. Uh, Vancouver is the largest port on the west coast of North America, so we have a lot of industry. Uh, we had air quality like Beijing until about the early 90s because of a very rigorous system of uh, permitting that we do, so I'm happy to talk more to you about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was very good. Um, I'm going to close the session. Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. Perdona. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm very agree with the guy of Grenoble. I think so. That uh, you say before that it's very important with what kind uh, of urban planning or urban policies that we are implementing because on the bending of these uh, policies um, we can change the situation or we can uh, generate a worse situation. No? And this is very important now because now in Barcelona mobility, ecology and urbanites are together in the same way no? <laughs> with the same challenges. And this is for me is very important but we need uh, also um, the cultural behavior change of the people, no? from people, because if, the, if people don't change the way of live or move or work, we can't do these uh, proposals, because people it's, are very resistant to these changes in our city. No? In general, more in popular neighborhoods, for example. No? But I'm very agree too with the, the, the travel of gentrification no? or the uh, problem with right to housing. For me, only way we have one recipe is more social and public housing. And this is the first and the most important, and we need complement it uh, with these policies when we change or we generate more pedestrian spaces or um, pacification strategies or the super blocks strategies too. We need put in the center of these policies the right to the housing, and for this I think is very important. And we need a big, very alliance, I think so, uh, between uh, different cities inside of the, Spain, in, uh, of the state of Spain, because we need to change a lot of policies and our uh, legislative uh, rules, but we need a global new agenda of cities. And I think so, this is a good spaces to, to start to build. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annette. That was very good. And um, well, I'm just closing this session uh, with the proposal that there was uh, the guy from Grenoble put forward on the table. I mean, this is a space that it is thought as a as a as a, an arena to exchange ideas and experiences. But why not be the seed to articulate uh, this global city agenda that we need? to coordinate. So uh, if you were registered in this uh, workshop already, 
you, we already have your emails and your contact if you have sneaked in because there was a space. There was a, a, a Cesar has a, a, a sheet to write your email and make sure we have it because we will share with you all the notes that has been taken and that could be the starting of a coordination network for mobility and pollution. And last but not least, I thank you very much for coming to this session. Uh